Uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is Khaled Musallam. I am the director of PEER, and I would like to welcome you all. Uh, we almost have a full house. I think some other people will come a little bit later. Uh, so we have uh, two days uh, planned for you. They, they are not full days because we, we designed them this way. So we have a lot of discussions. So we have lots of minutes of discussion. And it's intended this way. Uh, so this is unlike uh, our annual meeting. It's not a presentation after presentation. or uh, So we don't have keynote lectures. It's supposed to be short presentations and lots of discussions. Uh, so I'll talk about that. So I just have a few remarks. Uh, some of them are related to what we're doing in these two days. Some of them are just to give you a glimpse of what we do in peer these days. Uh, what has happened in the past year, and a few other comments. So hopefully I won't take more than 20 minutes. You told me I can use more, but I'll try to stay with 20 minutes. Uh, last time we met was in the annual meeting. It was a great event, and not too far from here. Um, the theme was the peer at 21. We're still at 21. We're still in, in 2018. Uh, so, and the theme was the practice uh, of performance-based earthquake uh, or performance-based engineering for natural hazards. Uh, the first announcement is the 2019 uh, annual meeting is under planning. Uh, the theme is obvious. It will be the 25th anniversary of Northridge. And uh, we have been talking to our colleagues in UC Irvine and UCLA. Uh, to co-plan this event, so it will be held uh, somewhere in LA, most probably UCLA or maybe UC Irvine. So we haven't decided on the we decided on the city, but not exactly where in the city. Hopefully, we will know soon. Um, it, it will be a good time to reflect upon uh, what we have learned in the past 25 years uh, from the North Ridge event. Uh, so that uh, stay tuned for more announcements uh, about this. Uh, to remind ourselves uh, what SPEAR, uh, PEER is all of you, and uh, we have uh, many active institutions. Uh, uh, we we delighted to have uh, University of Nevada Reno now joining our 11 core institutes and several other affiliates that are active. Uh, the theme uh, of activities within PEER are still integrated performance-based uh, engineering, uh, specifically performance-based earthquake engineering. Uh, you have seen this slide many, many times. Uh, so that's still uh, really the, the, the brilliance of those who started PEER. Uh, that slide is a testimony of their brilliance because we still keep showing it and it's always fitting the times we are in and the research we do, because it's a, it's a very good vision uh, that uh, can last for several years of how you break down the problem uh, to different disciplines and different areas, and the connectivity of these can have a, a nice mathematical equation, but also have nice graphics associated with it. Uh, so in addition to that expansion in US, we also have activities that are more worldwide. Uh, we used to be a member of the board of directors of GADRI, the uh, Global Alliance of Disaster Research Institutes. Uh, now peers serve on the advisory board. Uh, the mission of this very large uh, coalition of institutes, which now have reached about 150 of them, uh, is to combine technology and multi-hazard expertise uh, of multiple institutes, have reached, as I said, about 150 uh, across continents for interdisciplinary approach to reduce global disaster risk and increase resiliency. So many of the words that uh, we hear in all our meetings these days, uh, but really engagement in Gadri have been very useful in seeing what other areas of natural hazard, uh, what is the language they use, not, not just Japanese versus English, but it's the language that's used in different hazard domains can be really different and 
and can be confusing at some point. Uh, if you want to learn more about the Gadri activities, uh, a little bit of peer involvement in it. There was a paper that came out that summarized the uh, third global summit uh, of Research Institute for Disaster Risk Reduction. Uh, so that's available in the web and you can read more if, if you want to be engaged in, in one way or the other with these uh, many institutes. In peer, uh, we're still active in our analytical simulation. Uh, Frank walked in a little bit uh, a little time ago. So the activities in open seas on bridge PBEE, uh, which is fitting to this meeting because this meeting is mostly about uh, the transportation uh, system program. Um, activities in hybrid simulation, uh, we're still doing quite a bit of work on that. Uh, I saw uh, Gilberto a while ago, so we're still active in that sense. Um, the, um, recently we had some inter or uh, several forms of interaction with MTS to continue development of Open Fresco. Uh, databases is still our uh, backbone of really doing research, the NGA uh, uh, cohort of activities. Uh, SPD can use a little more work, uh, not much have happened for a while now. SPO, this seismic uh, performance observatory, lots of activities related to uh, that database. I will say a few things about that at the end. Uh, we have been really interested in doing more and more of these blind predictions. Last year, uh, it was a successful event. It highlighted uh, some good things and mostly some deficiencies in how we do simulations. Uh, 19 teams have participated in this exercise. Um, they used a variety of uh, nonlinear analysis software. Uh, OpenSeas by far was the one that's mostly used. Uh, it doesn't mean it was the, the one that won the competition, but uh, definitely the spread use of it uh, is indication of the how the community embraced this platform and, and naturally we uh, need to continue uh, working in developing things and understanding why uh, certain things weren't predicted well and, and, and so on. Uh, so that uh, motivates us to make use of all these facilities. Uh, last year blind prediction was mainly an effort between UC San Diego and UC Berkeley uh, in terms of testing facilities, uh, first class testing facilities uh, all over the 11 campuses uh, can really benefit uh, the community from more uh, uh, design, the blind, uh, blind prediction. Uh, so stay tuned for an upcoming one. It's an effort between UNR and uh, UCSD. Uh, it's more focused on geotechnical aspects, uh, so we are not only try to, my background is structure engineering, but we have to balance all the expertise uh, within peer and the interest in a variety of topics. Uh, so we are in the planning phase uh, of releasing that, uh, so hopefully uh, that will be also another successful event. Uh, as I mentioned, there is, uh, there, was, there is quite a bit of activities related to workshops uh, and we would like to do more of this. So this is just one example of a workshop we held in, in this room last March uh, in collaboration with MTS, focused on hybrid simulation. Um, several of you may have great ideas of a workshop that's topic specific. Uh, Peer would be happy to facilitate that. Uh, it can be held here, it can be held in your own institution. Uh, we can help in advertising this and helping people to register and so on. Uh, I really would like to thank the peer staff of taking the effort on, on updating our website. Uh, having a website that hasn't been updated for 15 years is not a good idea. Uh, eh, and again, forgive us, this is done by really non-expert in web development. So it's done by our peer staff, 
and we, we do our best. Some, some links may be broken, hopefully everything is fixed now, uh, but it's really effort by uh, Gabriel, Christina, and Erica, and Amarnath, and so it's, we didn't hire a webmaster to do this. We, I, I just couldn't justify to myself paying a $10,000 for someone to just develop a website. Uh, but it may have some uh, things that you may not like. Let us know. We'll try to fix them. We'll try to improve them. Uh, we may have missed the important uh, piece of information or important link or important event. Uh, we have so much stuff in, in peer that goes back many, many years. So there may be something we missed. There may be a broken link. There may be a tab that need to be included. Your feedback will be really uh, important. But I have been checking, uh, doing spot check here and there so far. Many things are working well. I haven't run into uh, problems yet. Uh, our reporting uh, still going strong, but I have a request from you. Uh, this year, we haven't had many reports submitted yet. We encourage you, if you have a phenomenal uh, PhD thesis or a master thesis that came out, you would like to publish it as peer report. Uh, we have very good editing, as you know and uh, we continue to support that. Um, we reinitiated our peer annual reports. So far we have two reports. If you want to get more and more information about what has happened, all the events and so on, uh, we move, we switch a little bit from kind of end of the year report uh, to like mid-year report that span two halves of two consecutive years. So we went like from 2016 peer report to 2017 slash 2018 peer report. That works a, a little better in terms of timing. But being able to continue to produce a first class report every month plus some uh, is really a phenomenon. I don't think any institution can do that. It's, it's like having a department that produce a PhD thesis every month. That's, that's a very good uh, 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 publication rate. So uh, with your support, that will continue. Uh, one of the new areas are, I would say, you know, relatively new, is to push more for data use, uh, not just the data storage. Uh, so I showed this before uh, just to give a summary of what we do in terms of uh, data-driven structured health monitoring. So we have been doing some work related to that some work related to vision-based structured health monitoring, a little bit on the sensor development. I'll show one example of that because it's related to the bridge activities uh, that is funded by uh, uh, the Lifelines program from Caltrans. Uh, development of the database of SPO, uh, lots of activities related to that, uh, such that it become the a repository or the platform where lots of this data uh, can be uh, handled and manipulated. So the example I always show, if, if the west span of the Bay Bridge is instrumented and we can monitor all these instruments, uh, we can actually have a rapid uh, reporting about the health of important signature structures as such. But it's not just doing the straightforward, or actually not exactly straightforward, but the uh, conventional uh, data processing and uh, uh, system identification, but maybe doing a little bit more uh, of the supervised learning or unsupervised learning, trying to get more and more into the data science, at least data science terminology. I think that would be good for peer. Uh, lots of interest in every campus on data science, and for us to try to dodge this and not take advantage of this, of it is not in our best interest. We have lots of data that if you talk to computer scientists, they would really love to get this data. They would really love to get the domain expertise we have because they struggle with that. They, they, they know how to do things well in terms of data analytics and all this, but the domain expertise, they still haven't embraced that. And I think we can be really uh, leaders in that regard. 
uh, sensors are becoming uh, cheap and everywhere. How to capitalize on all this data, how to make use of it. I am sure the same center is doing some work on that. I am sure other uh, entities, I am not claiming peer is inventing anything new here, uh, but embracing it, I think, is something uh, really uh, important. I'll show one very simple example. It was an idea uh, 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 by Tom Chance that uh, we thought would be great, is to try to develop a sensor that can measure bridge settlement uh, uh, on long term. So I'm not going to go into too much detail, but just to show you uh, what we try to build is if you do a laser-based uh, measurements, you have a laser emitter, you have a camera-based receiver, uh, so you can take the crosshair of the laser and find out where it's X, Y, Z, uh, such that you can do this measurement. You can do that in a very cheap way uh, by doing power control that uh, a combination of Arduino and Raspberry Pi, such that you can control the uh, power consumption. Uh, you can benefit from the data collection uh, tools that you can put together, the visualization, doing a little bit of computer vision, manipulating the uh, crosshair. The, you see a lot of ripples here of, the, of that laser crosshair. That's a very zoomed picture because we're using a very, very cheap laser with very, very lousy lens. So that's an artifact of the lens. Uh, but then if you just uh, run a, a, a Sobel operator, on, which is a common operator to calculate gradient in computer vision, in the X and Y, fit some Gaussian distribution, uh, get rid of the noise, uh, even with such lousy measurements, you can bring down your accuracy to two pixels. It can't be better than this. So if you have a better camera, you can imagine what two pixels mean. In the case we have been working on, that brings your accuracy to six thousandths of an inch. And this is not a theoretical number because we actually ran a little experiment uh, that's in the, uh, in the basement of Davis Hall uh, where you have your laser module, you have your camera module, you have a little rail that can change where is the camera is located, so you fake what settlement is, right? And you take your readings. Uh, we're trying now to build a little case for our sensor. We use a little bit of uh, 3D printing. Uh, and results are very interesting. So here, uh, this is actually a local server that we put together that sits in one of our machine. Uh, data is collected. You do all the computer vision algorithm. So this is an example where we applied no change of the elevation of the camera. We applied 500, uh, 1,500 of an inch, applied a quarter of an inch. The data goes straight to, to the server, gets manipulated. And you see these steps indicate the actual location of the camera or actual location of the laser, which has to do with something moving with respect to the other and being able to capture it getting a clean measurement such that it gives you almost a zero. Zero is, is a terrible number, and it's very hard to get zero in anything. So you always get a little bit below or a little bit above. But you get your 15 hundredths of an inch or quarter of an inch with no big deal. So that's, that's one small activities uh, we're working on. And thanks to Tom of being a visionary to actually fund this as part of the uh, Lifeline program. Um, SPO is actually where most of our new data go in, uh, whether it's uh, data from instrumented buildings or data from images uh, that I will talk about in a second. Uh, so Gabriel have been working hard to uh, uh, keep that alive and active. It has been used when uh, our, a group from uh, Pierre went to Mexico. Uh, where they were able to upload images uh, immediately to SPO. If the data analytics are working there, we could have been processing some of these images uh, in real time. You may have seen several announcements about this uh, Peer Hub ImageNet challenge that is uh, out there. I am really impressed with how this is developed. That was a very simple idea we thought of because of SPO that uh, Professor 
Steve Mahan has led uh, uh, its vision. And we said, well, if you have all these images, can we actually do a little bit of labeling of the images or annotation of the images? Then can people use these annotated images to do some uh, uh, classification of damage in as close to real time as we can? And then we, we start learning about how, what people do with images. Then we learn what Stanford have been doing for several years with ImageNet Challenge. Uh, they have been holding that since 2010. By the way, they stopped doing it this year, maybe because we started. I don't know. They are afraid of the competition or something. Uh, so 2018, they don't have ImageNet Challenge. I, I don't know the exact reason for that. So the, the, what will happen, or at least that's what we're thinking, is we're going to be holding this every year. We're going to be providing the uh, competitors with a large number of labeled images. This year, probably it will be about 12,000 because we're doing this ourselves with a small group of people. Uh, if people are interested, you can apply now. The, the application is open. And I want to give you a little bit of, of important information. The, the competition will actually start in August 23rd. Uh, this is when we are going to provide the applicants with the labeled images, the 12,000 or more. At the moment, we have about 8,000. We're still working hard to get to the 12,000. Our initial target was 20, but it looked like 20 is getting harder. But once we open this for application, so far we have 30 teams. That's a total of 70 people have signed up. And this is within about uh, uh, two weeks. Uh, we still have the, uh, we are not going to close the uh, application period so anybody can apply. So that's 70 people who have interest. And I thought in the beginning that would be mostly CS, stat type of people, but actually it's not. It's about 26 teams that are civil engineers who have interest in getting involved. And uh, that also motivated us to really think of, of giving awards. So there will be an overall uh, winner. And there will be a winner of each task. So the chances of people winning is really high. <coughs> but what I'm impressed about is the fact within a week or two, we had 30 teams with a total of 70 people applying. Mm -hmm and you look at their distribution, they are from everywhere. So it gives an indication we're really thinking in the right direction. There is interest out there. There is expertise out there that we may not be uh, aware of. So if you go to the uh, SPO website, you see also a little uh, um, app that you can, uh, in terms of uploading images, you can do that anytime. That's open. Uh, in terms of labeling images that are already on the database, you can do that any time. The final labeling become a uh, majority vote. So if, if one image gets labeled uh, 100 times, uh, that this is uh, 99 of them, this is a shear crack, one time this is a cat, probably it will be labeled as shear crack, not a cat. You know? so it's, I use cat and dog because that's what mostly ImageNet does. So again, wh why this is important, in every field, there is a sort of an image net now, um, in space, uh, different events, and so on. So we thought, well, we should have this fee uh, image net. And really, the, the main reason is this. When they started uh, image net challenge in 2010, they had 35 competitors. We are 30, and we haven't even closed the door. So we're getting close to that. And you see, sometimes even it went below uh, 19. And with the increase of the number of teams, the error in the prediction went significantly down. Starting with 28%, went down to 3%. So we hope that will help us in understanding how our structures perform, how our different components perform, which hopefully some uh, clever people can take that information and improve our uh, computational uh, predictions. So ultimately, uh, we will have uh, different uh, tasks that uh, will be the competitors will be asked to predict. Um, they vary in their level of difficulty. Some of them are just binary, which is easy to get. Uh, some of them have multiple uh, uh, <laughs> outcomes. 
And if eventually this become an app that you have in your cell phone, you take your image, gets uploaded to SPO, all the data analytics happen there, then you have a classification of the image you have taken. If you want to read a little more about this, there is a paper that came out that looked at a, a first generation of this effort. We collected, uh, at the moment, 25,000 high-quality images. Not all of them are labeled. So far, we have uh, about 8,000 of them labeled. We hopeful that half of that, about 12,000, will be labeled before August 23rd, which will be when the time to release or start the competition. Uh, a little bit of, of background on that you can find in this paper, which is, uh, uh, again, available uh, on the web. So now switching to the topic of, uh, of this workshop. Uh, so we, we're focusing on projects related to transportation systems research program, a little bit also from the uh, Lifelines program. So these are the uh, funding platforms that uh, uh, support all these projects that you will hear about. Uh, just to remind you, last year we released uh, our request for proposal. You may have read this document. Uh, several people uh, have formed the uh, research committee at that time uh, to craft this uh, request for proposal, uh, which is based on previous work. Again, we didn't reinvent the wheel here. We just took what uh, others have developed uh, and uh, uh, we added a few things here and there. Uh, so that was released in October 2017, and projects started in December. Uh, we ended up funding about 17 projects, with about uh, five or six funded by either TSR, um, the Lifelines, or uh, uh, continuation from previous uh, years. Um, so the research topics uh, revolved around five or six major areas, uh, geotechnical engineer with several subtopics, uh, performance-based earthquake engineering of bridge and other transportation systems, uh, several areas of application, um, the, the methodology itself, uh, which doesn't have to be specific to bridges, but it may be used bridges as an example, and also several PBE tools uh, that people may be interested in developing, visualization and so on, uh, like bridge PBEE uh, that Professor El Gamal is doing, for example. So that uh, resulted in currently uh, 24 active projects. Uh, I believe at least 22 of them are presented in this event, only two that have late starting, even some of them have very late start but still presented like ET project just started, but we're happy that you are able to tell us what you are going to do. Uh, but some have started really late and uh, they will not be presented, only two. Um, so we have also other projects funded by the Lifeline that will be presented, like, like the workshop that uh, Sashi Kunas has led. He will come later today, he, he just told me he will be here. Also Professor Filippo's project funded by Lifeline will also be uh, presented. So you have uh, a single handout uh, which has the program for the two days uh, that give you the list of all the projects that will be presented. So I'm not going to go through the list, but the point I want to make is we have 16 presentations today. Uh, I urge the speakers to talk maybe for 15 minutes and then leave five minutes for direct Q&A for their uh, this is specific projects, mainly for classific uh, clarification rather than discussion. And then after each session, we have between 25 and 30 minutes to discuss what is presented in each session. Uh, so we're going to have today a total of about 100 minutes of discussion, uh, not including the breaks and the five minutes after each uh, talk. Uh, tomorrow we have even longer time for discussion. Uh, about 145 minutes. We put a, a journey time of 4.30. Uh, we can extend it to 5 if you are interested. We can shorten the 145 to 115 and you can leave half an hour early. It's, it's, it depends on how things will uh, progress, but tomorrow we have only 12 presentations and again more time uh, for uh, discussion. 
In the back of this single handout, this is my last slide, uh, we listed a few questions that uh, we thought they would be useful uh, for the presenters to uh, be aware of and mainly also for the discussion uh, to try to answer this question. Others, of course, may arise. Uh, but you get the idea that uh, we want this not to be uh, a set of projects that are disconnected. We would like them to be connected. We would like this to be a real program. So you are the best one who can tell us how your project fit in the TSRP program. Uh, are there specific projects that uh, your project can benefit from, can interact with, so you, within the two days. So that was the reason of avoiding breakout sessions and the Jutex talk to themselves and the structure talk to themselves, because there may be a lot of uh, things to benefit by listening to your colleagues and, and seeing what they do. Uh, we're all busy and mm -hmm. taking advantage of these two days to see what others are doing will be really important. Uh, how can we initiate this interaction between these projects? So you may find something that really interests you. Uh, we may have a better mechanism than you just calling your colleague uh, by putting this in the RFP in the next round, for example. So, so how to make this interaction really tangible and, and uh, happening? Uh, are there any areas of put, uh, that potentially can enhance uh, the program uh, that we can include in the uh, future request for proposal? Uh, here, future is very near future. We're talking about next month, uh, at the most early October, we're releasing the next request for proposal. We get the good news uh, July 1st that we have our million dollar again. You know, every year we, we hold our breath that uh, there's going to be a budget cut and we are not going to get the, the million dollar that we give a, we give in this RFP. Uh, so we had confirmation this year we have our funding and that's again uh, PEER is trying to reduce expenses as much as we can such that this uh, research funding is really used for research. So that's uh, the whole idea. Uh, so a new RFP will be coming out soon. Um, it may be exactly the same description or slightly different or dramatically different, we will see. Uh, again, industry partners is very important. They have been supportive uh, to peer. Uh, their membership and all that is very useful for our operational budget. And their engagement and their uh, touch of reality of what really the, the industry needs, uh, there is only a handful of